of the real saints I've met was a homeless man in Tokyo. He looked like what he was, one of life's casualties. He kept himself in food and drink by collecting scrap cardboard in a cart and selling it. Every day he came to a soup kitchen. Most of those who came ate and left. Many would offer thanks for their meal. This man made it a point to visit the volunteers in the kitchen, asking how far they had traveled and thanking them for their generosity. He was a gentleman. One winter day, he came with a man who had been struck by a car. The center had a free clinic and the doctor examined him. There was a broken bone in his foot, but the injured man refused to go to a hospital. The doctor agreed that complete rest outside a hospital bed would eventually work as well as rest in such a bed. From that day on, the gentleman cared for the injured man. The cart became home for him. For six weeks, the gentleman gave his food to the patient. Since the cart was now a hospital bed, the gentleman could not work to earn even his usual poor living. One cold morning, the injured man shook the gentleman to wake him. He was dead. Six weeks of giving up most of his food and six weeks of sleeping on the winter's sidewalk in order that his friend might sleep in the cart had cost him his life. In John's Gospel, Jesus says, there is no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. When I learned of the gentleman's death, I was embarrassed. After all, I know these words of Jesus. I know the promise of eternal life. Yet here was a man who may never have heard of Christ, but who did what I have never had the faith and courage to do. Gradually, I realized that the gentleman and I had something in common. He was, without doubt, a saint. That's not what we have in common. What we have in common is imperfection. His problems and imperfections were obvious to anyone who looked. Mine might be better disguised, yet even so, their prominence to me, at least. Isn't it true that we tend to see what is lacking in our lives, in our faith? The broken part of my life overshadows the child of God that I am. From childhood on, people point out our shortcomings. Ask anyone to make a list of his or her failings, and one sheet of paper will not be enough. Ask the same people to list their qualities that show them to be sons and daughters of God, and when the list finally appears, after much hemming, hawing, and crossing out, it will be short. Today's continuation of our Easter celebration is a joyous proclamation of the great love God shows in calling us to be united with Christ. It's a day to look at our faults and failings and put them in perspective. Next to God's love, they're nothing. Can I give thanks today for God's love that does not look at my faults, failings, and weaknesses? In the Acts of the Apostles, Peter sees that God's love will not be limited. I begin to see how true it is that God shows no partiality. God showed love through Cornelius and that gentleman in Tokyo. God can and does show that same love through me as well. Love then consists in this, not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us and has sent the Son as an offering for our sins, says John. All humankind is embraced by that love. Throughout this week, let's make an effort to see the children of God hidden in our families, our friends, our foes, strangers, and even ourselves. Let's look beyond the problems, sins, and weaknesses that too often draw our attention and see how great God's love is. Chosen to know and proclaim the Son, we Christians are especially blessed. Among our blessings is the knowledge of who it is that acts in men and women, such as the Tokyo gentleman. Let us give thanks for that extra love that has called us to know Christ. Let us give thanks for God's love that overflows the church and shows itself through saints beyond our community, saints we might not even recognize at first glance.